it's great to get to talk to you today about um, what we're trying to do in terms of mapping the brain. Um, if we really understood the brain, could that help us simulate things like decisions and emotions, thoughts and feelings, which could potentially yield insights into new kinds of AI? Uh, clearly, the human brain can do things that are unparalleled by any other technology. Uh, and yet, how the brain works is still a mystery. Now, one of the big things we're putting forth is the idea that new technologies for mapping and controlling the brain might yield new data sets that could help us with this quest of simulating brain computations. The key issue is that the brain is very, very complicated. So if we really want to understand the brain to the point where we can make biologically realistic, comprehensible models of how brain circuits work, we need to have new tools. And there's another topic not really relevant to today's discussion, which is of course brain diseases affect countless people around the world, none of which can be fully cured. If we could uh, find out how the brain map is changing, maybe we could help people. So I'll tell you two short stories today about technologies we're developing to control and map the brain that we hope will yield data sets that could enable, maybe someday not too long from now, simulations that are biologically realistic and maybe human understandable. Now let's start with mapping. The brain is incredibly spatially complicated. A cubic millimeter of your brain will contain around 100,000 brain cells called neurons with incredibly complex geometry. And within that cubic millimeter, there will, there will be about 1 billion connections between those neurons. So this is incredibly complex. How can you see the wiring? And it's not just the wiring, all those cells are chock full of molecules. There are tens of thousands of genes in the human genome, and those genes encode for so many biomolecules, countless biomolecules that are inside those cells and between the cells that make them do what they do. But it's worse. The temporal dimension of the brain is also complicated. If you want to understand learning and memory, development and aging, these processes take place over months, even years. But the high speed computations of the brain take place at milliseconds, electrical pulses that brain cells generate that help them compute, and millisecond timescale chemical exchanges between brain cells as well. So today I'll tell you two short stories about how we're trying to help neuroscience cross space and time to collect the data sets that may someday enable simulations of brain circuits. Let's start with space. How can we map the molecules throughout brain cells and the brain cells throughout large scale networks? Well, many people have developed technologies for imaging the brain. I think we've all seen pictures like this, a brain scan. These are non-invasive and therefore are used very widely in neuroscience. But each of those yellow blobs that light up contains millions, sometimes even billions of brain cells. So you can't get the fundamental map. At the other extreme is the microscope. That's how brain cells were discovered in the first place over a century ago. But light, which is what the microscope sees, has a finite size or wavelength. And therefore, you cannot see the very fine wiring of the brain or the molecules with a conventional light microscope. So we started thinking, we often do the opposite of what people are doing. What if you could take the kind of swellable polymer that you find in baby diapers? Now, if you add water to the swellable polymer, it'll grow, an experiment that millions of babies do every day. The water is absorbed and the polymer threads swell apart and that's how the baby diaper works. What if we could weave chemically a dense spider web-like mesh of the baby diaper polymer inside brain cells and outside brain cells, in between biomolecules and around biomolecules? In short, all the way throughout a specimen of the brain. We call this technique that our group invented expansion microscopy. In the panel B, you can see a small piece of the mouse brain. The panel C shows the same piece of mouse brain tissue after we processed it, through, processed it with our expansion protocol. We've swollen it by 100 times in volume, about four and a half times in each direction. And what that means is now we can make nanoscale tiny things into large scale observable things. A regular old microscope can now become a nano imaging device. You can take interesting molecules like fluorescent proteins from jellyfish and coral and express them in brain cells. In this movie, you can see a piece of the brain where we did just that. We gave each brain cell a color code and then we expanded it. Our hope is by color coding brain cells and expanding them, we can now get unprecedented maps of the molecules throughout brain circuits and the brain circuits that mediate complex things like thinking and emotion. Maybe if we have enough detail, we could even simulate these brain circuits in action. 
Now, what about the time axis? It's great to have a map of the brain, but at any moment, the brain might be doing something, something different than it was a minute ago. The brain is generating high-speed electrical pulses. What if we could control those electrical pulses by delivering light onto the brain cells, and the brain cells are equipped with little solar panels so they can respond to the light? The solar panels basically convert light to electricity. Now, the brain doesn't feel pain, so we can bring in light through optical fibers or other implantable optics. Then the question becomes, how do we make brain cells sense light? Where do those solar panels come from? Well, it turns out all over the tree of life, you can find in single-celled organisms, like this algae you see in this cartoon, little molecules that convert light into electrical signals. This is a single-celled algae with an eye spot. I'm just about to zoom into it. The eye spot's full of molecules that act like little solar panels. When they're hit by light from the sun, they convert the light to electrical signals. And that's how this algae will see and helps it navigate around bodies of water. Now, we're very fortunate. This solar panel is not made out of silicon. It's a protein. And that means it's, it's encoded by a gene. And we can take the gene that encodes for this protein and transplant it into the brain using viruses, vectors that are used commonly in the field of gene therapy to put genes into the human body or in animal models of diseases to try to cure them. Turns out this is a small gene, a small piece of DNA. And so it fits directly into a common gene therapy vector that's even used in human gene therapies. A brain cell will take up this piece of DNA. And this is where serendipity struck. The brain cell started to make this protein, the solar panel-like protein, and install it all over the brain cell. And amazingly, it worked. When we shine light on the brain cell, the, the molecules were activated and the brain cell fired off an electrical pulse, much like the electrical pulses that your auditory system of your brain is creating right now as I say these words. Flash forward to the current day, we now have several classes of these molecules, which will take light and activate or shut down brain cells. So our hope is we can start to make these models by making maps of the brain and then using optical methods to activate brain cells to figure out what specific cells do. The map then helps us interpret what those impacts of the electrical pulses mean in terms of the network. Now, how do we actually go about doing this? I'll just end on this thought. Let's start with small brains. Worms and fish have hundreds of thousands of neurons. Mice have hundreds of million, let's say, and the human brain has 100 billion. But if we start to model small brains, maybe we'll learn a lot about how brain circuits work. And even small brains can do quite complex things. After all, they survive in the natural world with all of its complexity. So hopefully this will help us in the future to generate models of how brain, brains compute, and that might have interesting impacts on many fields, including AI.